This message is a presentation of Pinnacle Baptist Church and the preaching ministry of Pastor Ray McBerry. Other messages like this are available online at PinnacleBaptist.com. The church is located at 2517 High Falls Road in Griffin, Georgia. If you're in the area, we would love for you to visit us this Sunday. Now, here's today's message. I can't take a heart that's broken or make it over again. Oh, but I know a man who can. And I can't take a soul that's in sick. Make it white, white as the snow. Oh, but I know a man who can. Some call him Savior, the Redeemer of all men, but I, I call him Jesus, Amen. for he's my dearest friend. And if you feel that no one can help you, and your life is out of hand. Oh, I, I know a man who can. I can walk upon these waters, and I can calm that old raging sea. But I know a man who can And I can't cause the blinded eyes to open I can't make the lame to just get up Oh, and walk again But I know a man who can Some call him Savior, the Redeemer of all men. But I call him Jesus, for he's my dearest friend. And if you feel that no one can help you, and your life is out of hand. I know a man who can. Amen. Thank you, Brother Jim. Amen. Brother Jim and I did not plan this, but Brother Jim, that was the perfect song as a special this morning. Last Sunday in the morning service, the message that I brought was a message that was entitled, Beware the New Judaizers. And it was a message that I brought related to this movement that seems to be sweeping through a number of churches across America today. This movement that is teaching that as Christians, if you want to be uh, sold out to God, you have to go back to our Hebrew roots of Christianity, and you have to begin to uh, dig into the things of the Old Testament and the things of uh, Judaism and incorporate those things into your Christian life. If you want to be totally sold out to God, devoted to God, dedicated to God like you ought to be. And one of the things we talked about in that message last week is the name by which we call him. There is this movement, uh, this Hebrew roots movement, which part of it is known as the sacred name movement. And associated with it is this concept that 
You know, if we are really close to God, we ought to be calling Him by His Hebrew names. That is, when we're speaking of God the Father, we ought to be calling Him Yahweh or Jehovah. Or if we're talking about Jesus, we ought to be calling Him Yeshua instead of, uh, instead of Jesus or Yahuwah. Uh, one of the Hebrew names. But as I talked a little bit about last week, God didn't make me a Hebrew-speaking person. I was born an English-speaking person, and although I know my English is not the best sometimes, that's the language God made me as an English-speaking person. And I know Him on a personal level. I know Him intimately. I'm His son, and He's my father. When I'm talking to my daddy that lives up in McDonough, I don't call him by, uh, by his name in any other language than English. First of all, he wouldn't know what I was saying anyway, Miss Mary, but I call him daddy because that's the familiar name between me and him. Well, God saved me as a little boy that was an English-speaking boy. I know his name is Jesus. That's the song that Brother Jim just sang. I call him Jesus. And, uh, you know, when I'm speaking to him, that's what I call him. I call him, dear Lord, uh, Heavenly Father, Jesus, because that's the name by which I know him. He has a personal relationship with me, and I have a personal relationship with me. So uh, that tied right in with the message from last week. But it also ties in with the message from this week. Because the message that I want to bring this week is not, it's not a continuation of last week's message, but it's a message that goes right along with last week's message. Because this Hebrew roots movement that I preached against last week, it is a danger to the church today. And as I said last week, I I almost feel not only ironic, but but almost a little bit silly at having to address the very same issue in the 21st century that the Apostle Paul addressed in this book in the 1st century of the church. We ought not be having to address the same problems in the 21st century that we did in the 1st century. But Paul spent an undue amount of time in all of his epistles in the New Testament dealing with this very problem, and it is a problem, it is a danger which is trying to creep back into the church the closer we get to the end times. And I think that the closer we get to the rapture of the church and the coming tribulation that will follow, I think this movement is only going to continue to grow this fascination with Hebrew things, this fascination with the law, this fascination with the sacrificial system. Because once the church is raptured out of here, everybody that's left... Uh, they're either going to be in the Antichrist system or they're going to be in that new Jewish worship with a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem and a restored sacrificial system during the tribulation period. It's all coming, folks. And you can see it just by watching the things going on in the news today. We're getting closer and closer to that. But I want to I address part of that Hebrew roots movement that I did not even talk about last week. Last week I talked about why we as Christians do not observe the Sabbath as our day of worship. That is, Saturday is the Sabbath in the Old Testament. We don't worship on Saturday. We meet on the Lord's Day, which is Resurrection Day in the New Testament, in the church. Now, if you want to worship on the Sabbath day, there's nothing wrong with doing that. As I said last week, we really ought to be worshiping the Lord on Monday Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. But the day of corporate worship for the New Testament church, the Bible tells us they met on the first day of the week, which is Sunday, the Lord's Day, Resurrection Day. And so uh, we are not going to start holding our services here at Pinnacle Baptist Church on Saturdays. Now, if you want to have a Bible study in your home and and you want the preacher to be a part of it, I'll be happy if I'm able to, to come be a part of it. You come to my house, we'll we'll do whatever you want to do to study the Word of God and worship Him and sing. But our corporate worship at Pinnacle Baptist Church is going to continue to be on the Lord's Day, Resurrection Day, which is Sunday. The other thing I talked about last week are the names of God. And I just went through uh, an explanation of why we call Him Jesus, uh, 
We call him the Lord. We call him our Heavenly Father. We don't call him Yahweh. We don't call him Jehovah normally. We don't call him Yeshua or Yahuwah. We call him by his English names that we know him by because we're English-speaking people. Nothing wrong with calling him by those Hebrew names if you choose to do that, want to do that. Uh, But if God made you as an English-speaking person and you have a close personal relationship with him, I expect you ought to be calling him in the same, same language that you talk to your own mama and daddy here on this earth then. Um, So, I want to continue that vein of thought though. Those who are telling Christians today that they need to go back to their Hebrew roots and incorporate that into their Christian life if they want to be sold out to God, devoted to God, they're doing it because there's an agenda. I did not talk a great deal about this aspect of it last week, but I'm going to this morning. Now, I want to say as I begin this morning that I sincerely believe that the majority of Christians that are getting caught up in this movement are sincerely wanting to please God, sincerely wanting to be devoted to God. I I have spoken to some people, I don't know them personally, but I've spoken to some people that... Uh, have become part of this movement. And I believe, after having spoken to them, that the sincere desire of their heart is to be as right with God as they can be, to be as pleasing to God as they can be. But I want to say that those that are trying to bring people into that movement, they have an ulterior motive. They have a different agenda And I want to talk about that agenda this morning from Scripture. You see, that that first introduction to this Hebrew Roots movement, for most Christians, is number one, what name you use for God that we talked about last week. That's kind of, as one preacher called it, it's kind of the... Uh, the gateway drug into Hebrew, the Hebrew roots movement. The first thing they're going to hook you with as a Christian is calling him by his Hebrew names. And for the Christian, that's not a big step. I mean, that's a little thing. But, I mean, as I said last week also, it does sound kind of cool to call him in his Hebrew names. And it's okay to call him by his Hebrew names, but that's the kind of the thing that they, they use to hook Christians into starting down this road. Well, the next thing is the uh, worshiping God not on the Lord's day, but on the Sabbath day. That's the next step. And then if you follow that, there are some more steps that are coming up down the road, and those are the ones that I did not talk about last week that I want to talk about this week, this morning. Literally, in less than six hours last Sunday, from me finishing preaching Sunday morning sermon on this subject, I received an email from a dear lady that lives somewhere else across the country, not even in the state of Georgia, who listens to our our sermons and our Sunday school lessons on a regular basis. She is a dear, sweet Christian lady. She's emailed me with questions about other things related to the Bible before. She started originally listening to our sermons because of the series I did uh, almost two years ago on biblical cosmology. And then she started listening to our other sermons. I know that this lady loves the Lord because of the other things we've corresponded about previously. Never met her in person. Don't even remember where she lives. But literally within six hours of me finishing that sermon right here in this pulpit last Sunday morning, I got an email from her. Someone is trying to get her involved in that Hebrew Roots movement. And one of the things they have started to talk to her about is to try to convince her that the Trinity doesn't exist in the Bible. Now, I want to say that she's uh, uh, whatever, whoever that is telling her that the Trinity is not in the Bible, the word Trinity is not in the Bible. It's not. But it's a word that we use to explain a concept that is in the Bible. There are some other words that we use that are not in the Bible too. A theosophy, a Christophany, a theophany. Uh, There are other words related to concepts in that book that are not in the book themselves, but the concept is in the book. 
The word rapture is not in that book. But it's a concept that's in that book. The concept is there, but the word itself may not be there. Well, the same is true of the Trinity. The word Trinity is not found in the text of our Bible. But the concept of the Trinity is. And she was sending me this email asking me questions uh, uh, because she didn't know how to answer them. Now, praise the Lord, this lady, she wants to know the truth, so at least she went to a preacher to try to get some answers to this. Uh, and she came to a preacher that she felt like would, would give her some things out of the Bible. I gave her a number of passages out of the Bible. I'm going to send her some more stuff after today. But those who are trying to get Christians to go back to the Hebrew roots of Christianity, there's an ulterior motive. You see, they start with the name of God and then worshiping on the Sabbath and then, well, does the Trinity really exist? And they begin questioning the Trinity, normally questioning whether the Holy Spirit is actually a person or not. And that's what this person was trying to convince this dear lady of. That the Holy Spirit is not a person of the Godhead, He's just a force, a power. Kind of like Star Wars, may the force be with you kind of thing. No, the Holy Spirit is a person. The Bible says He does this, He does that, He does this, He does that in the pages of this book. He is a person of the Godhead. 1 John 5, 7 tells us there are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. Now, it doesn't get any clearer than that. But you know what now they do? Well, you know, 1 John 5, 7, it's one of those verses in the New Testament that really shouldn't be there. It's one of those verses in the New Testament that was added a thousand years after the Bible was written. Way in the 16th, uh, 16th century. Well, folks, that's not true either. That's a lie too. You already know your pastor did his master's thesis on the history of our English Bible and where the manuscripts came from. I have dealt with this question with other people for the last 20 years. I know the history of this question, and I know the history of that verse in the text and whoever is telling her 1 John 5, 7 was made up and added a thousand years later is lying and they either don't know the truth or they're intentionally trying to mislead her and other people. But that's what this Hebrew Roots movement does. It starts out kind of innocuous trying to get people to just call him by his Hebrew name. Observe him on the Hebrew day of worship. And then questioning the Trinity. Well, if you begin to question one person of the Trinity being part of the Godhead, well, that leads to questioning whether Jesus is God in the flesh. As you already know, the, the thing that all of the disciples and the early church dealt with with the Jews was that they didn't believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. God come in the flesh. That's why they crucified Him. They accused him of blasphemy for claiming to be God in the flesh. And the Apostle Paul dealt with it throughout the rest of the New Testament with the Jews trying to convince people that Jesus is not God. Well, I submit to you that the Messiah had to be God in the flesh. My message this morning is not on that particular subject, but that's the next, that, that, that's where they're headed. They want to convince people that Jesus is not God. Because they're worshiping the same false religion that the Jews worshipped in Jesus' day. And Jesus said of the Pharisees, Ye are of your father the devil. Because the religious leaders of the Jews in Jesus' day were not worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jesus said that point blank to their faces. But what's going on today? The John Hagees of the world and all these people wanting Christians to, to think that Jews worship the same God that we worship. No, they don't. Jesus said they weren't. And they're worshiping the same false God today that they were worshiping in Jesus' day. George Bush said during the first Gulf War that Christians 
Muslims and Jews all worship the same God. No, I'm sorry, George Bush worships uh, a different God than me too, but Jews, Christians, and Muslims don't all three worship the same God. Jesus is God in the flesh. The Jews don't believe that. The Muslims don't believe that. Jesus and Jehovah is the same God. Lord willing, next week, I'm going to prove that to you from Scripture. I'm going to show you verse after verse after verse after verse from both the Old Testament and the New that Jesus is Jehovah. But you see, that's where the Hebrew Roots Movement is pushing people. But the average Christian getting caught up in it, when they're in these early steps of it, they don't realize that's where those people are trying to push them. My desire as your pastor is to make sure that none of my flock get caught up in this, that you see through it, you know where they're going before you start down that road. Part of this Hebrew Roots movement. If you're going to hearken back to the Hebrew Roots before Jesus came in the flesh and was born in Bethlehem, you've got to go back to Moses and the law. Preacher, you hadn't even read the text this morning. Let's do that. Would you stand with me? I'm going to read our text found in Galatians chapter 5 this morning. I'll give you a moment to turn there because I've already preached for several minutes before reading our text, but I needed to lay the groundwork for what we're about to read. The passage we're about to read is one of many passages that the Apostle Paul uses to deal with this exact subject that I just explained up here. But keep in mind, he is talking about it 2,000 years ago. But it's the same issue. Look with me at Galatians chapter 5, Beginning in verse 1, Paul says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. But I, uh, behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever of you are justified by the law. Ye are fallen from grace. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ye did run well. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? The Apostle Paul is dealing with this subject of New Testament Christians going back and trying to follow the law now that they're saved. Being entangled with the yoke of bondage to the law even though they're saved by grace through faith. It's because there is a misunderstanding of the law. The purpose of the law. Who the law was intended for. And why. I'd like to deal with that this morning. The title of my message is Beware the Judaizers. Part 2. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that this morning you would help us to understand the important principles of Scripture that we're looking at. I know, dear God, that some of it is is not the milk of the Word, it is the meat of the Word. And Lord, to those younger Christians that might be listening to this message, give them the ability through your Holy Spirit to understand these things. For those that are already mature Christian, dear God, I pray they would not uh, turn off their minds and hearts, but they would... Listen attentively to understand the danger well enough that they could explain it to others. I pray you'd use this message for your glory and for our good. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. And you may be seated. 
Look at the text that we just read with me for just a moment before we go somewhere else. Look at verse number 1. Paul said, stand fast. That is, stand firm. Keep your feet planted in the same place they were planted when Jesus saved you. Don't wander from that place. God saved you by grace through faith. Stay there. Stay anchored there. Don't wander. Don't stray. Stay there. He says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You know, whenever I read this verse, I always picture the slave auction of days gone by. As a southerner, I know we get blamed for slavery in America. I don't know if you know this or not, but not a single slave trader ship that flew an American flag was ever registered to a southerner. Every slave trading ship that ever brought slaves here to America that were owned by Americans were from New England Yankees. They went, picked up the slaves, brought them here and sold them to make money, and then said it was our fault. Anyway, that's not today's message, but I pitch in that slave trading auction block where the slaves would be brought up onto the auction block one after another, and they would sometimes be in shackles most of the time. Uh, most of the time they probably either had leg irons or arm irons or something on when they were first arriving as slaves. But they would be brought up to the auction block and then they would be auctioned off to the highest bidder. The image Paul is trying to conjure up in our mind and in our heart in verse 1 is, listen, when you get released as a slave... When you get your freedom, they take off the shackles, they pat you on the back and say you're free. What slave that was mistreated would want to go back to where he was mistreated and say, would you put those shackles back on me? I'd like to just stay around. Now the reality is there were slaves in Jesus' day and time that were... Um, they were called uh, uh, doulos in the Word of God. That's the Greek word, doulos. It, it can either be translated servant or slave. Because a doulos was someone who they gave their, their servitude, voluntary or involuntary, to whoever the master was. The book of Philemon is written about a runaway slave, which, by the way, the Apostle Paul told the slave... Go back to your master. You weren't supposed to run away in the first place. But the slave, after serving out his servitude, if he was paying off a debt or something of that effect, could, could choose, if he wanted to, to remain a servant, a slave, even after paying his debt off. And what they would do is the owner would take the servant over and put his ear up against the, the wooden doorpost and with an awl, literally, drive a hole in his ear. By the way, you men that, you men don't have any earrings, praise the Lord. But those men that want to walk around with earrings, all they're saying is they're, uh, they're a slave to some other master. A free man doesn't wear earrings. Amen? I'm sure I'll have some feedback on that later too. But a slave could voluntarily become a slave for life if he had been treated right by his master and wanted to stay even after paying off his debt. And there were people who did that. But if you were a slave that had a cruel master, would you say, no, 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 I, I want to stay a slave. Would you put the shackles back on me? I don't want to go free. I don't want my liberty. No, no slave who's ever been mistreated would do that would say that. By the way, again, back to the Old South, after the war was over, there were multiplied millions of slaves in the South who chose to stay with their previous masters, even in many cases it took on their last name once they were freed because they had had a good relationship. But no slave who's ever been mistreated by a master says, 
No, I want to stay a slave. Would you put the shackles back on me? I don't want my liberty. No, that's not what a slave would do. And Paul says, for those who are Christians, who have been freed by the the grace of Christ, and you want to still be shackled to the law, in bondage to the law, why would you do that? That's what Paul is asking in Galatians chapter 5, these first seven verses. It makes no sense for a Christian who's been saved not by your works, not by keeping the law, but by, your great, by God's grace through your faith. Why would you want to go back and say, well, I don't, I'm not saved by the law, but I, I guess I'll go back and I'll try to observe the Mosaic law I'm not a Hebrew, but I'm going to try to observe the Mosaic law because I want to be devoted to God. No, if you want to be devoted to God, go out, live right, do right, think right, behave right. But that doesn't mean you have to put yourself back under the bondage to the law of Moses. Observing Sabbaths, observing new moons, keeping the feasts of Israel, uh, offering the sacrifices that Israel offered. Why would you put yourself back under bondage to that? It never worked for the Jews. Why do you think it would work for you? Why do you think it would enhance what you have in liberty in Christ? I'm not given my liberty to go live however I want to live after I get saved. That's called licentiousness. That's called uh, taking license. No, I'm not supposed to take license and go live however I want to live after I'm saved. I ought to live for Him. But I ought to do it because I want to live for Him. I want to serve Him. I am under no obligation to the Mosaic Law. Well, preacher, sounds like you're saying you want to do the the good things that the law talked about. I do want to do the good things. But they're the same good things that God told mankind to do Before there was a Mosaic law. The Mosaic law was for a particular people, for a particular time, and it was not for the New Testament Gentile believer. Did I make that clear enough? The Mosaic law was not for the New Testament Gentile believer. Preacher, give me some proof. I'm glad you asked. Let me do that for the rest of our time before it's all gone. This Torah observing movement says that New Testament Christians should observe and obey the Mosaic law if you're truly devoted to God. But what did Paul say about entangling ourselves with the law again? And was the law ever even intended for Gentile Christians under the new covenant? Those are the things I'd like to answer this morning. Why are we warned about those that are trying to lead us back to the law in every book of the New Testament? The things that I just warned you about are the same things that the New Testament writers warned the early church about in every single book of the New Testament. Jesus, in the Gospels, warned those of His own day of those that were trying to teach that you had to follow the law in order to be saved. I'm going to read several verses, give you several examples. Actually, I I tell you what, I'm going to give you the passages for time's sake. You can write these down, and I hope you will, and go back and read them. In Mark 2, verse 27, the Pharisees were trying to tell the children of Israel and, and those that were following Jesus, believing on Him as the Messiah, that he was sinning by healing a man on the Sabbath day. As I mentioned to some earlier today about working on the Sabbath day, if you're a firefighter or a police officer or this or that, Jesus told them, man was not created for the Sabbath, but the Sabbath for man. I'm not tied to keeping the law. The law is for my good. I'm not for the law. The law is for me. It's to help me, not me helping the law. But those who were Judaizers in Jesus' day and those who are Judaizers today, they want Christians to be in bondage to keeping the law. 
the same thing that the Pharisees wanted in Jesus' day. In Matthew 16, 12, Jesus warned of the doctrine of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. In Luke 12, verse 1, Jesus warned of the leavening of the Pharisees, and then He called it hypocrisy. Now, was Jesus saying that the law of Moses was no good? No. In fact, Jesus Himself said that He came not to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. You see, the purpose of the Old Testament law, at least in part, was to to foreshadow, to picture the sacrifice that Jesus was coming to make for the sins of mankind. Every little lamb that was ever sacrificed in the Old Testament was a picture of the Lord Jesus. Every offering that was made in the Old Testament under the Mosaic Law was to picture the offering of the Lord Jesus for us. Jesus warned of the Judaizers in His day. The Apostle Paul, many times throughout his writings in the New Testament, warned, just like he did in Galatians, of the Judaizers. The non-Pauline epistles in the New Testament all warn of those trying to put Christians back in bondage to keeping the Mosaic Law. The one book of the New Testament that's a book of history. The book of Acts. It even warns against the same danger. So in other words, every book of the New Testament warns of this danger of the Judaizers, the Hebrew Roots Movement, trying to take Christians in liberty because of their relationship with Christ and put them back into bondage under the Mosaic Law. Every book of the New Testament warns of this thing that so many Christians now are becoming enamored with. I praise God that to the best of my knowledge, no one here has started going down that road. Again, part of the purpose of my message today is to make sure you know and understand what what it's all about so you don't start down that path. In my message last week, I described, I think, at least four different groups of people who are most susceptible to going down this road and buying into this for different reasons. If you didn't listen to that message or you weren't here last week, I encourage you to go back and listen to it. I'll send you the link if you need me to. But every book of this New Testament warns of this apostasy. This danger to the church. I don't know if you know it or not, but those that are, those in Jesus' day and Paul's day who were trying to get people to go back to their Hebrew roots and to the Mosaic Law, they hated the Apostle Paul. And they still hate him today. I have read things written by a number of these Hebrew roots people over the last several weeks as I was preparing for these two messages. And they, they even go so far as to question whether Paul's writings ought to be in the Bible or not. Some of them say we ought to just stick with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and the words of Jesus. Throw all the Pauline epistles out. That's a big danger. Number one, because the Bible says Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, I don't know about you and, and your heritage, but... I'm not a Jew. My daddy was not a Jew. My grandpa was not a Jew. On either side of my family, I'm a Gentile. Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. I think he cared about people like me and you, and he wanted to try to make sure we we got the truth and we didn't start down a wrong path. He is also called the apostle to whom the mystery of the church was revealed. Peter, James, John, those other apostles that all walked with Jesus for three years and saw Him crucified and resurrected, their primary ministry was to Jewish believers, starting in Jerusalem and spreading out from there. 
the Apostle Paul was specifically called by God to take the gospel not just to Jews, but to Gentiles. That's my folk. If you're not a Jew, that's your folk. Whether you're Greek or Italian, whether you're Celtic, Scotch, Irish, Welsh, whether you're Germanic, whether you're Russian, whether you're this or that, if you're not Jew or your ancestry is not Jewish, you're a Gentile. And the writings of Paul were for Gentile believers in the New Testament under the New Covenant and specifically for the setting up of the New Testament church. We're not under the Old Covenant. We're under the New Covenant. Should we despise the Old Covenant? No. Jesus fulfilled the New Covenant. And what we have today is better than the Old Covenant. But I don't want to go back to the Old Covenant. If you got a, a brand spanking new shiny car, why would you want to go back to the one that's the floorboards rusted out in it? I don't want to go be under the Old Covenant. It was never intended for me anyway. I want the new one. I want the better one, Brother Jim. That's what the book of Hebrews calls the new covenant. The better covenant. There's a hatred of Paul. In Galatians 2 verse 11, the Bible even tells us Paul had to correct the apostle Peter on one occasion about this going back to the law. And Paul said in Galatians 2 11, I withstood Peter to the face. Boy, that must have been a tense day at the church in Jerusalem. I've been in some church situations where there were some tense moments between folks that disagreed about things. But I've never been to a situation that it must have been like that day where the Apostle Paul and the Apostle Peter squared off face to face and the Apostle Paul had to get on to Peter right there face to face in front of everybody. Whoo, I wouldn't have wanted to be there that day. Now I have read the Apostle Paul's preaching. Now he doesn't preach like those camp meeting style preachers, but I'll guarantee you that day he looked like a camp meeting style preacher. Brother Jim, I bet his face got beat red and I bet his finger was pointing in the air and I guarantee you that day the Apostle Paul looked like a camp meeting preacher when he was confronting this problem. I don't know if you know it or not. I, I, it's been a long time since I taught on Baptist history. Maybe we'll do that again sometime soon. But from... Uh, from a period of about 500 to 800 A.D., all the Baptist churches across Europe were known as Paulicians. Preacher, why were Baptists called Paulicians? Well, they believed the same thing that you and I believe. They were Baptist or Anabaptist, whichever you prefer to call them. Uh, but these Baptist churches were called Paulicians mainly by their enemies mainly by the Catholic Church. Why were Baptists called Paulicians? It's because Baptists said, listen, our rule of faith and practice comes from the New Testament, not the Old Testament. And specifically in the New Testament, they come from the writings of the Apostle Paul. Why? Because he's the Apostle to the Gentiles and because he's the Apostle to whom the mystery of the church was revealed. So when we want to know how the church ought to act, we go to the writings of the Apostle Paul. When we want to know what the ordinances of the New Testament church are, where do we go? The writings of the Apostle Paul. When we want to know what you're supposed to do, when one member of the church is acting like he's not supposed to be acting, we go to the writings of the Apostle Paul. Because Paul is the apostle to whom the mystery of the church was committed. So Baptists were called Paulicians by their enemies for hundreds of years. I've never been called a Paulician, but you know, if you want to call me that on the way out the door today, I won't be offended at all. We, could, uh, we have a church covenant, we have a church constitution, but the reality is all it does is take verses from throughout this book 
particularly from the Pauline epistles, and list those things we believe. But we could take the church constitution and the church covenant, we could wad them up, throw them in the waste paper basket, and just say, hey, uh, any book of the New Testament that was written by the Apostle Paul, that's our church constitution. Have any questions? Look up the writings of Paul. Because we're supposed to follow the Apostle Paul's writings. He's the Apostle of the church. He's the Apostle of the Gentiles. So what is the Mosaic Law that they're wanting us to go back to then? Well, it's all those laws that God gave Moses and the children of Israel at Mount Sinai. You know some of them. You know the Ten Commandments anyway. That's Exodus chapter 20, by the way, and those in our Sunday school class, it's going to take us a little while to get there, uh, but we're going to get to Exodus chapter 20 and the Ten Commandments. But it's more than just the Ten Commandments. There are many laws recorded in the books of Moses, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, laws that God gave to Moses. Now, I want to try to clarify this this morning so that if somebody approaches you with this concept, you know how to respond. You know what the Bible teaches. The Mosaic Law, first of all, uh, deals with three different types of laws. They're all together in the books of Moses, but they deal with three different types of laws. We have these three types of laws today, by the way. The first set of laws dealt with by the Mosaic Law is the moral law. Preacher, what's the moral law? Well, these are laws that deal with man's relationship with God. Let me give you some examples. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not commit adultery. You see, those are laws that are moral laws because they are a reflection of who God is. Does God cheat? No. Does God steal? No. Why would you need to if you owned everything? Does God lie? No. The moral laws of the Mosaic Law reflect who God is, and so they deal with man's relationship to God. If I violate those moral laws, I've sinned against God. Now, I might have sinned against some other people too, but I sinned against God because I went against something that demonstrates His character. The moral laws, they didn't just start at Mount Sinai. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness. Those aren't laws that God made up for the children of Israel and gave them to Moses on top of Mount Sinai. No, those are things man was supposed to not be doing all the way back to the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve got kicked out because of sin. The moral laws of God are for every human being in every age, no matter who you are. From the Garden of Eden to the end of this earth. The moral laws of God apply to everyone the same. And they change not. But there's a second category of laws in the Mosaic Law. Besides the moral laws. And those would be the civil law. The civil law deals with man's relationship to man. Let me give you an example. What happens if my cow gets out and he tromps through your field and destroys your crop. Well, that's a civil matter. That's uh, man's relationship with other men. There are laws about all those things. And by the way, there's a prescription for how to deal with each of those things. Those are the civil laws. Now, God gave them to Moses and the children of Israel at Mount Sinai We as Americans don't have to follow the civil laws that God gave to Moses and Israel. But let me say this. To the degree that our laws in America do reflect the civil laws that God gave Moses, we'll be better off. 
And where America has gone down a wrong path is getting away from the civil laws in this book and doing our own thing. If our civil laws matched up to the civil laws given at Mount Sinai, we'd be a lot better off. There's a third category of the Mosaic Law. They're the moral laws apply to everybody of every period. They're the civil laws that apply to Israel for their relationships of man to man, but it'd be good for every civilization to follow them. But the third category are the Religious laws. In Israel, they were known as the Levitical laws because the Levites were the priestly tribe of Israel. The Levitical laws, the ceremonial laws, the religious laws, they were for Israel's relationship to God as a nation. You see, the ceremonial laws were intended to make Israel stand out from all the other nations around them. To make them distinct, different. I'm not a Hebrew. You're not a Hebrew. We were not under the Mosaic law. Those ceremonial laws were never given to us nor our ancestors. Well, preacher, I I, kind of think as Christians, we're still under that same covenant... If we follow the moral laws and we ought to follow the civil laws, why shouldn't we also follow the religious laws, the ceremonial laws? Let me show you from the Bible why we should not observe those. Why we're not obligated to observe those and why we shouldn't want to observe those. In the book of Exodus chapter 19 the Bible describes how the covenant was made between God and Israel at Mount Sinai. Now, I've read this passage just recently, so I'll not read it this morning. But in Exodus 19, from verses 3 through verse 8, you have the story of that dialogue back and forth between God and Israel. Let me give you the shortened version of it before I continue. God told Moses up on top of Mount Sinai, tell the children of Israel that If they will keep my commandments, I will make of them a peculiar people, a royal priesthood. He went on to say, I will bless them beyond measure. And what he was saying is that I'll bless them so much if they'll obey me that all the Gentile nations of the world will be drawn to them like a magnet and want to say, hey, what's the secret of your success? Why are you so blessed? And then Israel would have the opportunity to say, let us introduce you to our God. He's the reason. So God said, Moses, go back down to the foot of the mountain and tell the people the offer that I've made for them. And let me know what their answer is. So Moses goes back down Mount Sinai. He tells the people what God said. And he asks the people for an answer. And the Bible says in Exodus 19... Uh, the people said, all that the Lord hath said, we will do. That is, they took him up on the offer. So Moses goes back up to the top of Mount Sinai and said, Lord, this is what they said. Now, did God already know what they had said? Sure, he knew what they had said. But this was an actual formal transaction taking place. A covenant was made that day. By the way, another word for covenant, a contract. This was a contract, a binding contract between two parties. God and the people of Israel. When you enter into a contract, you have to enter into it voluntarily. Nobody can twist your arm and make you or the the contract is null and void. Did anyone force the children of Israel to enter into a contract with God that day? No. They had a choice. God benevolently gave them the choice. And they chose to accept the contract. But once you enter into a contract, you're bound to the terms of the contract. The Mosaic Covenant that was made at Mount Sinai was a, it was a conditional covenant. That is, God said, if you'll keep my commandments... These are the things I'm going to do for you. 
If you don't keep my commandments, I'm not going to do these for you. That's a conditional covenant. Uh, in my business, I sign conditional covenants all the time. They're called contracts. We put them in writing nowadays. But it says, if you'll pay this amount of money, uh, this is how many commercials I'm going to run for you on the TV station. And if they pay their money, I'm bound to run their commercial. I agree to it. By the way, if I'm running their commercial and they don't pay the bill, uh, the judge says, hey, why didn't you pay your bill? Because you're bound to pay the money. You signed the contract. This is a different kind of covenant than the one God made with Abraham. The Abrahamic covenant in the book of Genesis was an unconditional covenant. It was a covenant where God said, Abraham, these are some things I'm going to do between me and you no matter what you do. Let me remind you what those things were. He said, I'm going to make of you a great nation. I'm going to make your name great. I'm going to bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you. And through you shall all families of the earth be blessed. What was he talking about there? He was talking about the coming of the Messiah. Through, through the line of Abraham. That through him would all families of the earth be blessed. Are all families of the earth blessed because Jews brought about banking? No. God was talking about bringing about the Messiah through the lineage of Abraham. And God said, Abraham, no matter what you do, I'm going to fulfill this covenant. An unconditional covenant. I'm so glad, like I said last week, that this Abrahamic covenant was not a conditional covenant like the one made at Mount Sinai. Because that meant that the first time Abraham blew it, we would all be out of a Messiah. We would all be out of a Redeemer, a Savior. But praise God, it was an unconditional covenant. Because Abraham proceeded to blow it multiple times. But God still kept the covenant. Because it was unconditional. But this Mosaic covenant was conditional. God said, if you'll do this, this is what I'll do. The Mosaic covenant was not to save anybody. All the laws that God gave to Moses for the children of Israel to obey, they were not to save anybody. They were for blessings, not salvation. Did you get that? Because everybody else in the Hebrew Roots movement, they've missed that. The Mosaic Covenant was for blessings, not for salvation. Nobody was ever saved by keeping the law of Moses. In fact, nobody ever completely kept the law of Moses, nor will they today. In Romans chapter 4, Paul tells us that salvation is by faith. Even Abraham was saved not by his works, not by going where God told him to go, not by uh, circumcising his son like God told him to circumcise his son. Abraham was saved by his faith. Romans 4 says, What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of death. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Folks, if you're counting on your good works or keeping the Mosaic law to save your soul, you're in trouble. Because you're going to blow it just like Abraham blew it. Just like Moses blew it. If you're saved, it's only because you've been justified by the grace of God through faith. Why then would you want to go back and entangle yourself into bondage under the Mosaic law when it was not for you in the first place and it never saved anybody in the second place? In Romans chapter 10, 
Paul tells us that the Jews, they totally misunderstood the purpose of the law. They were trying to use it to work their way to heaven. Listen to what he says in Romans 10, verses 3 and 4. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ, listen, is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. That one verse all by itself is good enough reason for me not to try to start following the Mosaic law, not to even uh, be interested in, in, in wanting to follow the Mosaic law. Paul said plainly, for Christ is the end of the law. The purposes of the Mosaic Covenant were to form Israel as a nation. And the purpose of the law that He gave was not to save anybody. It was to show people that they couldn't save themselves. That they needed the righteousness of God through faith. In Romans 3.19, Paul tells us why the law was given. He said, now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law. That, why? That every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. You know, the only value of the law for me as a Gentile today is that it showed me that I'm a sinner. Because I could... I didn't even get through the Ten Commandments without finding laws I've broken before. I bet you're in the same boat. Say amen, not an oh me. Amen. You see, the purpose of the law was not to save anybody. It was to show us that we're in need of a Savior. That I can't save myself. That's the purpose of the law. So let me say one last thing about this Mosaic Covenant that the Hebrew Roots Movement keeps wanting us to go back to. As I said, a covenant is a contract. The contract is only binding between the parties who enter the, the covenant. Who were the parties to the contract? God and the nation of Israel. I'm not part of the nation of Israel. I've never been part of the nation of Israel. You're not part of the nation of Israel. And unless you're a Jew, your ancestors weren't part of the nation of Israel. We were never parties to that contract in the first place, Brother Jim. So why would I, as a mutt mongrel Gentile, who's been saved by grace through faith, why would I want to put myself under bondage to a contract that I'm not responsible for. I'm responsible for enough as it is. Why would I put myself under bondage and be responsible for somebody else's commitments? That's craziness. Nobody ever gets called into court and is made responsible for commitments somebody else made in their contract. I'm only responsible for my contracts. Praise God. I've got enough on my plate. Keeping my nose clean, as my great uncle used to say. I bet you're in the same boat I am. I know I'm about finished. My time is, is up. There are some elements of the Levitical laws that they're wanting Christians to observe today. I've already told you some of them. Calling him by his Hebrew name. Worshiping on the Sabbath. Here's some of the others. There are five offerings under the Levitical laws. There are seven or eight feasts and festivals under the Mosaic law, depending on whether you combine two of them. The Sabbaths, there are weekly Sabbaths every seventh day. There are yearly Sabbaths every seven years. There's a Jubilee every 50 years of Sabbaths. There's the observance of new moons. Brother John... If you're going to follow the Mosaic Law, you've got to get out there with your trumpet every new moon 
And uh, the neighbors are probably going to wonder if you uh, flipped your lid, but, but if you're going to observe the new moon like a Hebrew, you've got to follow certain requirements. The dietary restrictions. Now, I guess this is probably one of the things working in our favor. Because I don't know too many Southerners that are going to give up barbecue pork and catfish for any Hebrew roots movement. I can assure you this Baptist preacher ain't going to give up either one of those. I like catfish, but I love barbecue pig meat. And I'm going to keep eating it. God told Peter when that sheet came down out of heaven with all those unclean animals, he said, arise and eat. And every Baptist since then has been eating off that sheet. And this preacher ain't going to stop. A covenant is a contract. It's a binding contract on parties that are pledged. Who are the parties to the contract? God and Israel. The church is not a party to the contract. Gentile Christians today have no obligation to the Mosaic law. In Colossians 2, verses 13 through 17, the Bible says that He has blotted out our transgressions, that I am no longer responsible for observing new moons and Sabbaths. Uh, Romans 14, verses 5 and 6, tell us as a Christian in the New Testament under the New Covenant, I can observe uh, the holy days that I want to observe if I do it for the right reason, or I cannot observe holy days as long as I do it for the right reason. I can eat certain meats or not eat certain meats as long as I do it for the glory of God. In Galatians chapter 2, verses 3 through 5, Paul would not even allow his, his companion Titus to be circumcised to please those Judaizers. He said, no. I will not allow you to be circumcised just to please the Judaizers. And if he's not going to allow uh, Titus to be circumcised, he's also not going to tell Titus, as a Gentile believer and a preacher boy, he has to go observe all the new moons and the festivals and the feasts and the sacrifices of the Mosaic law. In Matthew 23, verses 7 through 11, Jesus said, Call no man on earth your father. Boy, the Catholics are in trouble, aren't they? He said, call no man master, which is what the word rabbi means. I know some of these Christians in the Hebrew Roots Movement, they're inviting Jewish rabbis to come teach in their churches, hold their Bible studies. There's nothing that an unsaved rabbi has to tell my flock that I can't stand up with the Word of God and preach from this pulpit myself. And if I can't do the job, you go find another Baptist preacher that will do it instead. Don't invite some Jewish rabbi to my pulpit. Either, either you're going to get rid of me or I'm going to get rid of you, but we ain't going to both stay here if you invite a Jewish rabbi to come preach in my pulpit. Preacher, it's not your pulpit, it's God's. I know that, but I'm responsible for it. And I've got to give account to everybody that stands behind this pulpit and every word they say. And ain't no lost Jewish rabbi coming and speaking at my pulpit at Pinnacle Baptist Church. So what's the verdict? Should a Gentile Christian today follow the Torah, the Mosaic Law? No. I was never a party to that contract, ever. And Paul's admonition is for us to not observe it, or at least not feel required to observe it, because we shouldn't want to go back to being in bondage again. He prohibited Titus from being circumcised. He didn't say, do it if you want to. He said, no, I will not allow him to be. I think he would, if he were standing here in this pulpit today, he would say, uh, well, can we observe the Mosaic law if we want to? I think he would be saying, no, for the same reason he told Titus he couldn't get circumcised. You're not going to do that to please anybody. You don't have to do it to please God. If you do do it, you're doing it to please somebody else. You cannot do it. I will not allow it. I think that's what the Apostle Paul would say. You're given a wrong testimony if you voluntarily try to follow the Mosaic Law. Because it's not for you in the first place, and it never saved anybody else in the second place. Paul would say no. Should a Jewish Christian today follow the Torah? 
Well, the Bible says that even for the Jews, he brought about a change in the law. Now, there are some of the parts of the Mosaic law that are going to be observed even in the, even in the end times, during the tribulation and the millennial reign of Christ. But I will tell you that uh, God said that there's coming a change in the law, and that change came when Jesus died on the cross, was buried, and rose again. Listen to what he said. I know, this is, this is my last, last verse. Hebrews 7, verse 12. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Now, God's the one that wrote the law. These Hebrew roots movements say, well, would God, would God make laws and then say, don't follow them? That's exactly what he just said. He said, now they've been changed. If he's the one that authored them, he's the one that gave them, he's entitled to change them. If he chooses to, isn't that what happens up in Congress? They make a law today, but if they decide ne next month they want to change it, they change it because they're the ones that have the authority and they're the ones that wrote the first one. They have changed it whenever they have a prerogative to. God had a prerogative and he changed the law. Hebrews says we have a better hope under the new covenant. A better testament, a better covenant. Better promises, better sacrifices, better rewards, better country, better resurrection, and a better mediator. And by the way, we also have a better menu to eat off under the new covenant. These dangers of the Torah, Torah observing, the sacred name movement, the Hebrew roots movement, there are dangers. First of all, many of those that are involved in it have pride and arrogance toward those Christians who don't participate and don't agree with them. I've seen it. I've witnessed it myself. They look down their noses at Christians who don't do these things. And their secret handshake is calling them Yahweh or Yahuwah or Yeshua. That's their secret code word for each other to know if they're part of the movement or not. I call him Jesus. I like the song Brother Jim started us this morning with. I call him Jesus. The dangers of this movement are being judgmental, putting yourself back into bondage instead of liberty, and eventually believing in a works-based salvation, which is totally foreign to this book. I hope that my flock will never succumb to the temptations to think there's something alluring about going back, hearkening back to our Hebrew roots. Am I glad for the, the Hebrew heritage before Christianity? Of course I am. But I wasn't under that covenant. I'm under a new covenant, a better one. And I want to stick with the one I got. Would you stand quietly and reverently to your feet with heads bowed and eyes closed? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd use this gospel invitation for your glory. Dear God, I know the preacher's been long today. But Lord, this is such a danger. Oh God, I pray, protect my flock from wrong thinking, wrong doctrine, wrong believing. Lord, keep us pure until Jesus comes back for us. We're looking for him in the clouds any day. Use us, I pray, in Jesus' name.